Charles, you doing all right, buddy? Yes, sir. I'm pretty good. I'm doing good. Thank you, Charlie. Hello, Charlie. Hey, Bobby. Hey. How you all doing today? Doing fine. How about you? Yeah, doing good. Good, good. Hey, James, I'm doing good. You doing all right? Here. <laughs> You're present in the county for, right?
messed up more in or whatever. Right. And so they had to put him back. <clears throat> so they don't know how long they'll keep him on any duties. Right. And his wife also, Teresa, mm -hmm. she's she's real bad off. She has to go twice a week for uh, kidney dialysis. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Can't even think this morning. That's okay. Anyway, yeah. she's in a lot of other things wrong. So what's your last name, sir? Well, the Lord knows. Yeah, you know, the Lord knows. I can't pronounce it. I understand. <laughs> but anyway, her daddy's down there with him, and he said he's not leaving until Don gets out of the hospital. Okay. So if he comes home. All right. Because she has to have someone to take her. She can't take him. And she can't drive. And she's very young. She's only probably in her 50s. Right. She's probably a little May's age. Both very good. Little still a young lady. That's exactly right. She just don't know it. <laughs> Her and Melissa <laughs> both still a young lady. <laughs> we had children. <laughs> All right. Yes, Shirley. Um, all right. Update on my nephew. Uh, got word from his dad. Uh, they have hospice there, but he's not even able to get out of bed anymore. Yes. So, I'm sure but, will. Uh, I also want to put my sister Teresa Whalen on the prayer list. Um, she just found out she's going to have to go in probably sooner than later. She popped or snapped something in her right shoulder and they did an MRI yesterday, but they're thinking they're going to have to go in and do rotator cuff surgery. So, but anyway, that'll teach her to be picking up too much stuff out doing yard work on her. It'll slow her down one way or the other. One way or another. So, Guaranteed. But, uh, yeah, she's she's hurting pretty good this week. So. Oh, I bet she is. Yeah. Bless her heart. Well, we got her in our prayers too. All right. Yes. Uh, if you're in your prayers, Marvin, put back to me a fifth this morning. Okay. Some more back. Yes, sir. Well, we definitely going to keep you in our prayer, James. I know that hurts, mm -hmm. and your whole body hurts when your back hurts. Mm -hmm. Deborah. Uh, yes. Larry Duke, good Christian man, one of my clients, been in the hospice for the last two, three weeks. He's unresponsive, and he is on a ventilator. And he is his wife's caregiver. She is <coughs> third or fourth bout of cancer. Um, so keep him in prayer. Um, Paula Morgan, uh, she had developed, she's in her late 70s, early 80s, Guillain Barr disease, mm -hmm. a neurological disease that paralyze her. She has been in the hospital for about two and a half, three weeks. Both of these people are precise. Um, they, she is now getting some of her strength back and movement, but keep her in your prayers also. And while she she did come down with COVID-19 after the that uh, get hurt. And then my brother, Roy Guthrie, 80 years old, had a stroke this week. Uh, put him on the prayer, got some people praying for him. He is already home, so God is good. He works, and he took care of him, so. Amen. And he'll take care of the rest if we just. Keep our faith and trust him. That's right. right. That's right. Well, that's one. Martha? And the captain and Judy. Captain and Judy. We don't forget them. They're wonderful people. And, uh, of course, Betty. Let's pray for Betty Rogers and Lewis Taylor. Let's remember Lewis and Pauline. And Debbie got a uh, procedure done with uh, two stents, is that two right? Stents, yeah. But she said she can run circles now, so that's good. <laughs> Opened everything up, and praise the Lord. And I'm glad you came through that way. Thank you. So let's keep Debbie and Carl, their family, in our prayers, okay? Anybody else want to mention one? Yes, sir. Uh, my youngest daughter, Sherry, I pray for her a lot. She called me this morning. She said, Mom, just keep me in prayer. She's struggling. But Stephen got a job yesterday, so he should start work this week. So that's a good. Oh, that's great. I remember a little.
Brother Stephen come in with that outfit on. Boy, he looks so sharp. ROTC, I believe it was. Okay. Well, we'll keep them all in our prayers. All right, Carol. Sometimes when we have our little home church, we don't get a real picture of what's going on in other churches. And this lockdown mess has got people out of church that may never come back. Yeah. Everywhere I go, they're running less than half of what they normally would. Now, if you've got health problems and you're concerned, you should stay. Right. But man, we got to get back in church. Our country needs us. Yeah, I agree with you. I was talking Our about community you know, needs. Preacher about that this week. I enjoy being able to go online, but because uh, you can reach some people that can't watch it and they need it. But I always say nothing can take the place of being here. You can't miss the fellowship because yeah. when I'm down, you'll lift me up. Yeah, that's the way the church is. You're down, I'll lift you up. Spiritual hospital. Yeah. People just are finding out that they just don't care. I'm not being mean and I'm not being ugly and I'm not trying to preach. Right. But man, if, if this world ever needed a good, strong church, and I'm not talking about grace, I'm talking right. about the body of Christ. Right. It's now. It's now. Yeah. So uh, yeah. if and when you pray, you think of the pray for the church. Yeah. yeah. But we not lose sight of what we're here for. Right. And you just can't get that at home. Yeah. Right. Amen. I hope you didn't vote. Okay. Yeah, let's pray for our government. They'll vote according to how the Lord leads you to vote. We can't tell you how to vote, but I thank the Lord we will. If you ask him, he'll show you what to do. And uh, anybody else want to mention one? How about, uh, yes, back in the back, Carol. Yeah. told me this week to pray for his wife. She got it uh, at uh, COVID and of course he's the pastor at Community and I think they had to stop the services for a week or two but they'll be back probably next week but he wanted us to keep uh, her in prayer. Uh, he is also quarantining because uh, of all of this but I think it's really effective. Unspokens. Unspokens. Okay. Lord knows all the different unspoken requests. Gary, sure good to see y'all come in today. Will you leave some prayers we open up? Father God, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you for our pastor and for our church. Just pray for you for good health, preaching the word, Father God. And just help us in our daily lives as we <coughs> struggle with this pandemic, dear Lord God. Yes. Just bless those that are sick and just help us strengthen them, Father God. And just most of all, just encourage us. Help us to encourage yes. ourselves in the Lord and you. So we may come to you and acknowledge you and just give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise for the wonderful work that you are doing, Lord God. And let's not look at all the, all the things that we see going on in the world, dear Lord, but just keep our eyes focused on you and stay on you. We just pray for all the prayer requests that were lifted up, Lord God, that you have answered them according to your divine will. We just love you and we thank you and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God.
here for that prayer. Okay, we've got a couple of announcements we want to mention. Don't forget tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, we'll have Paul's group. Paul's all ready to go. He's got his red shirt and black slacks on today. So that's his, uh, th that means he's going to be playing some of those curly cues tonight. Is that right, Paul? And uh, everybody come if you can. We will put it on the radio. If you don't feel comfortable coming in, you can go out in the parking lot. And I think we will be putting it on the uh, online. But he's got pizzas for everybody tonight. I think two pizzas a piece. Is that right? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> he's got enough for everybody to get filled up. So 6 o'clock tonight, we're going to do this special service. I, I just enjoy a good song service every once in a while. And we're going to uh, start singing maybe one song. I like to at least sing Amazing Grace. I mean, I don't think I've heard a thing. And uh, so bad this theme song, Amazing Grace. Uh, but anyway, let's pray for Paul and uh, straightway. They come tonight at 6. Then don't forget we are doing two special projects. We're doing one for Thanksgiving. And if you would like to give a special gift to help needy people in Thanksgiving, there's some uh, envelopes in the back of the pew. That's what that's for. And we will be uh, assembling several people on the Monday before Thanksgiving to go out and get the food and box it up and carry everybody uh, basically the same thing. Uh, it's going to have all kinds of turkey and trimmings and all the desserts and all the rest of it. But if you'd like to help, you can put your offering into that. And then, uh, Shirley, did you say something about anybody wants to come and help box it up? Come on, let Yes, the Monday. Monday before Thanksgiving, we'll be meeting here at the church at 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock, yeah. And we're going to go ahead and assemble all the boxes and get mm -hmm. them packed so the right people get, the right families get the right box. And then at 5 o'clock that evening, we're going to deliver. So if you can help out there, be glad to have you stay. Amen. And if you have somebody you know that would need Thanksgiving, uh, there's some slips of paper out there. You can put their name on it. I think they said 20 miles from the church. Within 20 miles, they'll go out and deliver it. So uh, if you have somebody you know that's really needing something, you can pick that up, fill it out, turn it in. They're going to try to get a list and know how many to prepare for. Then at Christmas time, we have the shoebox with uh, Franklin Graham's group, Samaritan's Purse. And uh, there's a list for that over on the little bench. There's a lot of little items. If you want to be bringing them, there's a box out there. And they give everything from <coughs> toothbrushes to little dolls and pens and school supplies. And they put them all in a shoebox. And they go all over the world and have little children to have Christmas. And you say, boy, I can't believe anybody don't have Christmas. In the world, there's a lot of people that still don't have Christmas. We are blessed in our nation. And... Uh, I would hope everybody has a Christmas because that's when we celebrate the birth of Christ. So if you'd like to participate in either one of those, the Thanksgiving or the Christmas project, uh, there's several different papers out there. You can grab one and uh, let us know. Okay, I believe that's about all the different announcements. Of course, uh, Joe is out, so we won't have Sunday school today, but hopefully we'll be back with that next week right after the service. And uh, thank, at this time, I want to see if we have any birthdays. I understand that uh, we have Easton back there, two years young. Is that right? Two yeah, yeah. years young? He's in the nursery. Oh, is he in the nursery? Okay. Well, we'll sing happy birthday to him as well. And somebody up, Brooke. That's right, you got a birthday. You stand up there. Okay. Brooklyn has a birthday. And we missed Polly last year. Right? And we missed Polly. Polly, you want to stand? Or you can just stay seated. James done told on you, okay? Brooklyn, how old are you? Five years young. Goodness, isn't she a pretty little doll? I'll tell you, she's a pretty girl. Anybody else? Don't forget anybody. Uh, actually, wish you could go. Oh, with Ronnie. Her. We didn't get Ronnie's actually. That's right. I remember that. Okay. Okay. I don't want to forget anybody. Okay. Let's say happy birthday. Okay. All right. Can I just get up here close? Sure can. I ain't got that stuff. No, you ain't got it. No. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.
there's some people outside, so you get a chance to go out and check with them. Don't miss anybody. All right. Okay. Randy, you want to lead us in prayer right before we take her off? Sure. Lord God in heaven, I thank you, Father, for this warm building, Lord, fellowship, Lord, and friendship. Thank you, Lord, for your word that's going to be preached here today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, now for an opportunity to give a portion back to you, Lord, to continue this work, Lord, throughout the land that you have given us. And I thank yes. you and praise you for it and everything that happens in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let's all stand with Sing Amazing Grace, the first verse and the last. Yeah, it's like old times when we start singing Amazing Grace. Yeah. 
same father. <laughs> you know, James and Jude had Joseph as their father. Jesus had God the Father. And uh, the Holy Spirit came down to Mary. So uh, they all had Mary as a mother, but he did have brothers and he did have sisters, the Bible teaches. So if you think about it, when you're reading these epistles from James and Jude, they're actually telling you things that they have watched for all their lives. They saw how he lived. They saw what he did in certain circumstances. They had been around him over 30 years. Uh, so that's a long time to study somebody's life. And so that's why I love the little book of James. It's the Proverbs of the New Testament. Proverbs is the book of wisdom in the Old Testament. We've been preaching through that on Wednesday nights. And uh, James is the book of wisdom in the New Testament, and it's Christianity and shoe leather, all application. And I want to ask you a question today. Has anybody had a problem this week about anything? You did raise your hand. I figured about everybody in here has at least one problem. And I want to preach on that because I keep trying to build you up and let you know that God's going to bring you through this, what we're going through. God has got plans for your life, and the rest of your life is still the best of your life. And uh, I want to bring a message, how to shout when you want to pout. <laughs> how to shout <laughs> when you want to pout. Uh, you ever just feel like going over in a corner and pouting a while, you know? I've been there. We have a pity party. Oh, me. Oh, me. I tell you, I really have it worse than anybody else. And uh, that doesn't help a thing, only makes depression and discouragement creep in even more. But when we realize everything that's happening to us is for a purpose, God is using it uh, for a purpose. And so when you look at this passage in James chapter 1, they're describing how Jesus handled problems. If there was anybody I would want to ask advice uh, from on how to handle the difficulties of life, it'd be Jesus. I'd say, Jesus, how do you handle this when it happens? How do you make that decision? 
What do you do when this occurs? And he would answer. He would tell you exactly the right thing to do. And you can get that guidance as you pray and as you read your Bible, but James has put it down in written form. And so look at verse 2, and we're going to go down through verse 6. James 1, verse 2. <clears throat> he's writing to brethren, so he's, this is to the church, this is to us. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or different temptations. That's hard to do, isn't it? Yeah. First thing that we want to do when we go in a, a trial or a burden or a problem is complain or kind of withdraw or get upset. But he said, hey, wait a minute. Count it a joy. There's something underneath the surface going on that we don't see. Verse 3, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. Everything that's happening to us is building up our patience and our faith in the Lord, he said. And then notice something else. He goes on to say in verse number four, but let patience have her perfect work that she may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. He's talking about let patience complete you and mature you. Now there's no one who is sinless. Only Christ was the only one who never committed a sin. As long as we've got this old world of flesh this old world of wickedness and Satan himself, there's going to be times when we're going to blow it. What do we do? We go to the Lord, confess it, forsake it. Yeah. He washes and cleanses us. The fellowship is restored. But yet he says here that it's all working for our good and for his glory. That's what it's doing. He says in verse 5, I love this verse, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not. The word upbraid it means he'll never rebuke you or say, I wish you'd quit asking me that. <laughs> do, do you remember when your children were about two years old <laughs> and they asked you questions about everything? You know, their little minds are, uh, are two or three, four years old. They're, they're wanting to know what's going on in the world. And so they ask you this, ask you that, and you have to explain it ten times. <laughs> and they still ask you again. But he says God will never get tired of answering. God will never get tired of uh, helping you. God will never get tired of giving you wisdom. It will be given to him, he says in verse 5. But he says there's a condition. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth, he's like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And when you watch that ocean, you see those waves. They go back and forth, back and forth. And that's where our life is when we lose our faith and we quit trusting God and we think, boy, it just doesn't work. Oh, we're going to be tossed back and forth. But if we have a strong faith and we realize everything that happens to us had to come through the plan of God and he is using it to build your faith in the Lord and to complete you and make you a stronger Christian. So he says, knowing all of this behind the scenes, it's a work God's doing in your heart. Woo! Rejoice about it. Because you know God's making you into a giant oak tree. He's making you into something very strong. So the message, how to shout when you want to pout. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer right before we look at it and preach on it. Father, again, we thank you for letting us come together to share the word. And I pray for each one here today. Lord, I thank you that they're in church. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to worship you and Lord, just praise your holy name and study your precious word. Teach us through this virus and all the other problems people are experiencing. We all go through valleys. We all get through the storms. And yet we know that there is a purpose. And we know that you're over all of them. You're going to bring us through them. And so I pray that this message will lift us up in our faith. And that we'll trust you and know that, God, everything's all right in your care and in your house. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How would you like to be able to follow Jesus around just for one week and watch how he handles life? Watch how he handles problems. Or maybe for one month, you'd like to just, well, I'd love to be with him for one month. Every day, get up and know, hey, I'm going to be with the Lord today. I I'm going to watch him. I'm talking about in the flesh now, in his body of flesh. How about a year? How about 20 plus years? Every day, seeing him for over 20 years. James, the half-brother of Jesus, does just that. He is the leader of the church at Jerusalem. 
he and Peter, but James more or less is their leader. And he has grown up watching Jesus every day. He relates what he has learned to us in this passage and in this book about temptation, trials, burdens, problems, and how can we handle them? How do we face the storm when it comes our way? Maybe you've had a terrible week this week, a lot of problems, or maybe it was a good week with no problems. Either way, file this message away. You'll need it one day, and you may need it this morning if you've had a rough week. The good news is this. You can profit from your problems. Always remember that. You can profit from your problems. Yes. It's not what happens to us that's really important. It's what happens in us and how we respond. Now, the first thing I want you to remember is this. Expect problems to come. Just go ahead and expect it. We're in a world of problems. They're going to come in every fashion and every shape, he says in verse 2. Notice again, James 1, verse 2, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into divers or different temptations. James drops a bombshell right here at the beginning of this letter, and he says rejoice when you are tempted. Rejoice when you are burdened down and have problems to come into your life. Now, it's not when, but uh, it's not if, but it is when. Notice that. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into his problems. We will fall into them. He knows that. And so there's nobody's going to live a problem-free world. Somebody would say, well, if you become a Christian, all your problems will be gone. No, that's not true. I tell that to John the Baptist. <laughs> Had his head cut off. Tell that to all these apostles. They all died, except for John, by martyrdom. They were killed for their faith later on in their lives. So we know that the world is full of problems, so you might as well just expect when they come, they come to the rich, they come to the poor, they come to the young, they come to the old, they come to the male, they come to the female. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 16, verse number 33. Might want to make a note of this. John 16, 33. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but cheer up. <laughs> You see that? Why? I have overcome the world. Woo! He said you can have a good old back to cost you shout a bit. Knowing that whatever you go through, God's going to bring you through it. He's going to use that to make you stronger, and you're going to come through it, and the next time you face a trial, you're going to think, well, he brought me through that one. I'm still here. I'm still breathing. God's still paying the bills. Everything seemed to be, I might be by the skin of my teeth, but thank God I'm doing well. And just expect it, and it won't catch you off guard. Listen to what the Bible says about problems in Job chapter number 5, verse number 7. You remember old Job? He had all these riches, and he had all of these different things in his life, and all these children, and all of a sudden, the devil came to God and said, the only reason that he is praising you is because you have blessed him more than anybody else. And the Lord told the devil, all right, you can take it away, but don't touch it. And he did. He took it all away. His, all his children died in a tornado. He lost all of his servants. He lost all of his livestock. I mean, every bit of it was gone. And then he didn't curse God. He said, well, God's still in control. Well, the devil went back to God and said, flesh for flesh. You touch him with sickness. You touch him with a health issue. He will curse you. And God says, well, you go ahead and do it. Now, you notice he had to get permission from God. But he said, you go ahead and do it, and he did. And he went and touched Job, and Job had what's called elephantitis. You say, what does that have to do with an elephant? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it was kind of like leprosy. Most medical doctors think that's what he had. It was sores from head to toe, and he couldn't get any relief. And I mean, pus-filled and itching, and he went out there in the ash heap, or we would call it today the city dump, and he put on sackcloth and ashes, which was a sign of mourning, and he scraped them with pottery, scraped his sores to try to get some relief. I never want anybody to scrape any of my sores. When Mom told me she was going to pull the Band-Aid off, I said, don't do it, Mom. And she'd rip it off and ice cream for two seconds. I said, I'm glad to go with it. <laughs> Boy, I was so glad when she came up with a new medicine, Proxide. You remember the old, <laughs> the old alcohol? Boy, that really burned. When you had a scratch and you had a sword, she put that alcohol on. Man, I was 
I was burning, but when she got props, I actually said, let me try something new. And it didn't burn a bit, but I had lemon meringue all over my arm. But <laughs> besides all that foaming up, I was okay. I said, Mom, what's all that foam? She said, oh, it's killing all the germs. <laughs> I said, okay, at least it's not hurting. But Job said, when he was touched with all of this elephantitis, his wife even came to him. And she was the only one left in the family. All the children were dead. And she said, why don't you just curse God and die? And you know what he said? Woman, you're speaking foolishly. Don't ever curse God. Though he slayed me, yet will I trust in him. That's what Job said. Don't ever curse God. Though he slay me, I'm going to trust God. Whatever comes my way. And God gave him twice as much. And he had uh, all those children, had 10 more children. That means she went through about, I believe it's uh, 90 months of pregnancy. His wife had a lot of morning sickness. God got her back. <laughs> but anyway, Job says this. Job 5 verse 7, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. You ever felt that way? I mean, sparks flying everywhere. We're born into trouble. Just as surely as the weeds grow in the garden and the thorns grow on the roses, we're going to have trouble in life. They come in divers or different ways. If you look again at verse 2, it says there, when you fall into divers, temptation. The word divers means multicolored. In our language, it would be kind of like Baskin Robbins, you know, 31 flavors of ice cream. Uh, have you ever tried to match up paint? I mean, you go over there and you, and you want to match up some paint that you painted 10 years ago and they can't find the right one and there's so many kinds and so many shades and, and that's kind of difficult to do and that's the way trials come in our life. Trials can be physical, they can be financial, they can be relational. Somebody has said into every life some rain must fall, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> What I'm going through, huh? Trials are unexpected. That's why it says, when you fall. Now, that's the same word that's used in the story of the Good Samaritan. He fell among the thieves, and they robbed him. You cannot predict when trials are going to come, but you know when you're in one. And it doesn't take long to figure it out. And we go from problem to problem to storm to storm to valley to valley. But thank God, between the valley, there's always the mountain. And it might be low tide in your life today, but high tides are coming again. And you're going to go, and you're going to look back, and you're going to say, Woo, thank God he brought me through this. I am stronger as a result of my faith in the Lord. And then you're going to realize it was God all the time. He was looking after you. So they're unexpected. They come in different ways. Did Jesus ever have a problem? Sure he did. Think about this. He was born in a barn. At the age of 12, his mom and daddy left him in Jerusalem for three days. 12 years old, and his mom and dad had gone away and left him there in that big city. Kind of reminds me, when I was six years old, I got lost from my mama down at Clark's store. Anybody remember old Clark's store down in the city? And uh, yes, yeah, over in Bessemer area, and it was about the only store we had in the whole, the whole county over there. So it had groceries and it had department store. And I'd always go and look at all the sports, you know, baseball, basketball, football. And I, I got away from her one time and I got to looking at stuff. And she said to Martin, you stay right by my side. I'm, I'm going to look for some things. I said, Mom, I'll be right with you. And I got to looking and looking and looking and going from one aisle to the other. And all of a sudden I lost her. I was only six, and I thought, where in the world's mom? And I started looking around, couldn't find her anywhere. I went up to the front, and there was a desk up there, and I told the manager, I can't find my mom, I'm lost. I was crying, boy, was I crying. He didn't know what to do. He finally got on the loudspeaker, and he said, could the mother of this red-headed little boy please come up to this desk and claim him? He's driving us crazy. <laughs> I mean, I was lost. And every mom in Clark's department store came up there and stared at me. <laughs> and that embarrassed me even more. They said, no, he's not my dad. He's he, no, no, I'm turning around and leaving. But, but boy, when my mama came up there, I took off a run, jumped in her arms, and I held on to her coat the rest of the trip. <laughs> I never did that. I'd get lost again right there. But now think about this. Jesus was tempted by the devil three times, 
The Pharisees wanted to kill him. As I said, his mom and daddy left him for three days in a big city. His closest friends, the disciples, forsook him and ran away when he needed them the most. Judas, one of his twelve, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. All of his own people, the Jews, hated him. The Romans crucified him. But you cannot keep the Son of God down. Because they put him in the grave and, woo, thank God he arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he is alive today carrying the keys of eternal life, saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm glad we can go to the Lord. When you get up tomorrow and go to work, the boss might be in a bad mood. A co-worker might be a little cranky. It might even be the blue flu season. You ever get the blue flu on Monday? Kind of hard to get back and swing of things. You go to work and you got all this work to do. And uh, kids, you go to school and maybe your girlfriend breaks up with you or your boyfriend breaks up with you or your teacher comes by, as I told you last week, and slaps you in the back of the head like mine did. <laughs> Just one time, that's right. Dad took care of that after that first time. But anyway, I tell you, if, I could have, if we could have got uh, teachers for child abuse in those days, we could have been rich today because <laughs> she hit me hard. <laughs> but you know what? It all has a way. As you look at Jesus and you look at your life, it all has a way of making you stronger. It all has a way of building your faith. You think, how am I going to get through this time? Well, I'm, I'll never make it. I'm hanging on by the skin of my teeth. I'm a goner for sure. Now don't forget, Jesus is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. And friends, notice, we know that God takes care of his children. Sometimes he lets us go through a storm so our faith is developed and we rejoice knowing it wasn't wasted time in our life. God was molding us and shaping us to be like Jesus. Just expect it. Number two, remember this. Problems do have a purpose. They do have a purpose. Verse three and four, knowing the trying of your faith, it's working patience. But let patience have her perfect work. You may be perfect or mature and entire, that means lacking nothing, and wanting nothing. Remember the problems that Jesus had, they all led him to the cross of Calvary where he died as our substitute. He wasn't dying for his sins. He was dying for our sins. Woo! Thank God we can have eternal life now by calling upon Jesus for our salvation. Yes, sir. The trying of your faith purifies your faith. Verse number three, that word trying. Notice this, the trying of your faith carries the idea of the testing of your faith. I mean, it's like the bird that has to get out of the nest and test their wings so they can learn to fly. I mean, God allows the test we go through to test us so we can fly spiritually and trust God. We all like the safety of the nest, but when he pushes us out of the nest and it gets a little scary, we have to learn to trust God. We have to learn to develop our faith in the Lord. Eagles push their little eaglets out of the nest and let them fall. And when they're about to hit the ground, the mother comes underneath them and rescues them, brings them back up. And they do this over a period of time until finally that little eagle starts flying. And then what's happened? That eagle has become an eagle because it's flying on its own. God is developing you into an eagle because every time you push down the nest, you think it's not going to work out this time. God comes along and rescues you. He takes care of you. And then notice the word for trying carries the idea of purifying gold and silver in the fire. I mean, Peter is actually the one that talks about this in 1 Peter 1, 7. He said the trying of your faith is even more precious than gold. And you know, gold's pretty precious. <laughs> but he says the trying of your faith is better for you than getting a bunch of gold. What happens? Notice, the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold. It perishes. Though it be tried with fire, might be found into the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Think about this, friends. The goldsmith takes the gold out of the fire. He purifies it. He skims the top of it because the fire makes the impurities rise to the top. And when he keeps it, taking all the impurities of the gold out, 
when he finally looks down and sees a reflection of his face in the gold, he knows that it's pure. And he takes it out of the fire. And the same is true in our life. Sometimes God puts us in the fire and we say, boy, it's getting pretty hot, Lord. How much longer? How much longer am I to endure this? And you, before you know it, he's pulled you right back out of the fire. And he's saying, you, you, you look like Jesus now. You're acting like Jesus. You're talking like Jesus. Somebody said the Christian is like tea bags. You don't know what's inside until you drop them in hot water. <laughs> They're trying in your faith. Notice this. It produces patience. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Seldom found in women and never found in men. <laughs> Anybody here say, Preacher, I wish I had more patience. We all do. Probably use more. I, I used to pray for patience until I read Romans 5, 3. Romans 5, 3 tells us tribulation worketh patience. <laughs> That's what he's saying there. God uses all the trials and the tribulation to help us learn patience. One of my first jobs after I graduated from high school was driving a little pickup truck. Every day I would make 130 stops every day in the city of Greensburg. And I was delivering eyeglasses and bank bags and all kinds of things. And 130 stops and it was just rush, rush, rush all day long. And I thought I would like driving, but after the first week I knew if I was going to have to make it in driving, I was going to have to develop some patience because I wanted a rubber car. I'd hit the horn and horn cussed and everything else, and I wish I could have just bumped a few of them. It's a trial. I mean, there's only two kind of people out there on the roads today, the quick and the dead. <laughs> and it got pretty tough out there. And I knew I was laying on the horn too much, and I knew I was being cut off in traffic, and I was saying, boy, I'll tell you what, if I could, I'd bump this guy, and I'd get him to teach him a lesson, and I tell you, I was about to go crazy. 130 stops every day, rushing here, rushing there. And all of a sudden, it's the Lord working in my life to say, calm down. Trust me. Everything's okay. You don't have to speed. You don't have to. I got two tickets in 30 days. That's when I knew. If I was going to keep my job, I better slow down. <laughs> and so whenever they laid a new stop on me, I just said, well, I might be a little late because I'm not speeding anymore. I've learned my lesson. He was molding me, getting rid of some of that bad temper. Now, I still not arrived when it comes to a temper, but I can say, thank God, I'm not what I used to be. Because God has worked in my life through a lot of trials. He's done the same for you. The word for patience carries the idea to be steadfast, to endure, to have a long fuse before you blow up. Huh? A strong person did not get strong accidentally. You think about that. Mr. America doesn't become Mr. America by sitting on the couch and watching TV all the time. He has to put some resistance to his muscles. What is he doing when he lifts those weights? He is tearing those muscles down so they grow back stronger. And the same is true with a Christian in our life. We go through problems and difficulties and God tears us down a little bit so we can develop even stronger and stronger our faith in the Lord. The trying of your faith produces maturity. I mean, you say, well, I'd love to be a good, mature Christian. Hey, it only comes through trials. Now, I wish it could all come like salvation. Salvation comes in a moment's time. You trust the Lord, you're saved. But Christian growth takes a whole lifetime. You remember Joseph? As a little boy, he was a tattletale. And all the brothers were mad at him because he had some dreams. And he told them, every one of you is going to bow down to me one day. Now, if my sister would have told me that, I'd have said, only in your dreams. <laughs> did you ever have a brother or sister who's a tattle tale? I can remember mom would make some cookies or some brownies and she'd say, now, don't anybody eat any of these till after supper and I'd come through and they was warm and they smelled so good. I'd go over there and sneak one out and rearrange the cookies or the brownies to where nobody would hopefully notice it. And if one of my sisters saw me commit the crime, they always hollered out, Mom, Marvin's eating the cookies. <laughs> He's eating the brownies. I got into so much trouble over it. But you know, in all honesty, I did the same thing to them whenever I could. <laughs> I tried to get them in trouble. But you know, that's exactly what happened with Joseph and his brothers. I mean, he's a tattletale. His daddy made him a coat of many colors. He didn't do that for any of the other brothers. And so they got so mad at him that, that Joseph, they were going to kill him. And then they ended up selling him into slavery. He went down into Egypt and was put in a prison. 
And you know, through 13 years of trials, God in one day took him from a prison and put him over a palace. And his own brothers came to him and did bow down to him. And he rescued them because the whole world was in a famine. And if God had to put him in Egypt, he, they would have starved and there would be no nation of Israel in that. God used Joseph to preserve the whole nation. He was amazing. Everywhere he went, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And he did not get bitter. He got better. The saying really is true. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Jerry Falwell said this, you can tell how great a Christian really is by what it takes to stop him or her. Some things knock people out of the race real easy. But some things knock you back, but you keep running. That person has a strong faith. Yes. I read about a young Christian trying to get in to preach, uh, and he wanted uh, to uh, also have him a peach farm and so he worked hard, and he had thought about going into the ministry, and he had this peach farm. And so he invested everything he had into the peach orchard first, and it blossomed beautifully. Then a frost, early frost came, destroyed the entire crop. And so instead of becoming a preacher, he didn't even go back to church for a couple of days. And his pastor got a little bit worried about him. And he went to see him and said, Son, I thought you had your heart set on being a preacher. And what, I ain't even seen you in church. And he said, well, pastor, I'm just not going to come back anymore. He said, why not? He said, do you think I can worship a God that cares so little for me that he let all that frost kill all of my crop? I don't even have enough money to pay my next bill. And the preacher, wisely and kindly, told him, son, God loves you better than he loves your peaches. And you see, God understands that while peaches can grow without frost, Christians cannot grow without trials. Oh, boy, did he get enlightened. God's not in the business of growing peaches as much as he's in the business of growing Christians. And he does it through trials. Friends, when you finally get that promotion or that position or whatever your dream is, you're going to realize it was a process God brought you through the whole time to get you to that point in your life. Number three, understand problems can be solved. They can be solved. Just expect them. And they're going to come, but they can be solved. That's why he says here, rejoice, request wisdom, and then learn to relax in God. Relax. Verse number two says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptation. James says, count it joy. That's hard to do. I mean, remember here, James is not saying to rejoice for the trial. He is just saying rejoice in the trials. None of us get happy when we have a flat tire. None of us get happy when the commode overflows into the floor. None of us get happy when we get sick. But that's not what James is saying. He is saying choose to rejoice in that problem, knowing that God is making you a stronger Christian and doing a greater work than if everything was going smooth. You can rejoice. Why? Every problem has a purpose. You can rejoice. Why? Because when you go through a difficult situation, God never leaves you or forsakes you. I don't know how many times I've heard it said, Preacher, I was laid off from a job, and it seemed like the worst thing that could ever happen to me at the time. But when I look back on that experience, it was a blessing in disguise. Now God gave me even a better job, and he has taught me to depend upon him for my help. Oh, God has a better idea than what we have sometimes. He says request in verse number five. Notice verse five. If you lack wisdom, just ask God for wisdom. I mean, think about it. I encourage you, pray every day for wisdom. Somebody has said wisdom is knowledge applied in our life. Have you ever seen somebody so smart they made straight A's, but they did not have enough wisdom to get out of the rain? That's right. <laughs> I had a good buddy like that. I'd say, man, get out of the rain. He'd, he'd just be sitting there soaking wet. But he, he outran all of us in the, in the scholarly area. He made straight A's. Relax. Have faith in God. He will provide. He will give you wisdom. You don't have to waver back and forth. I mean, it's kind of like one of the worst experiences I've ever had. We went down after being here a couple of years with some of the men in the church, and we went out on that water, 
and the tornadoes had come in that week and stirred the water up off of the coast of North Carolina, and we were going fishing. And we got on the back of the boat, and the guy, the captain said, now, if y'all want to go out, it's a little rough out there today. We won't go. We'll reschedule. Well, we'd already taken time off, and everybody didn't come down. We said, let's go. And he said, okay, here's a plastic bucket. If anybody gets sick, you can use the bucket. And everybody laughed, and I laughed. And I said, we ain't going to need that bucket. We're a seasoned fisherman. I've been out many times deep sea fishing before. And so we got out there, and after about 30 minutes of going straight up and straight down, I looked up in the front, and I said, give me the bucket. <laughs> they passed it back, and I turned green, and I, oh, I will not tell you everything happened. But I was so sick, I said, just push me off the boat and give me a barrel at sea and get me out of my misery. And I mean, it was that bad. And if you've been sick, said, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And finally they said, hey, we better turn around. We fished till lunch. I didn't fish any. But they weren't fighting. And finally one of them said, you know what, let's just stay in out here all day. These fish, we caught one fish. Let's go ahead and get him back before he dies and the church holds us guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've often wondered if the fish had been biting, I might have died out there. <laughs> but some of the most miserable times you're ever going to have, it's going to be like that boat trip. You're going to be going up and down. You're going to be wavering back and forth between doubt and faith and doubt. Just relax. Expect trouble, problems to come. Don't be surprised when they come. Remember, they do have a purpose. And understand, God is going to bring you through that problem. One way or another. And the greatest problem ever is a sin problem. And sin separates us from God. But Jesus paid the penalty for us. And if you'll come to him... He'll wash you and clean you and forgive you of your sin. Yes. And he'll make you a child of God. Yes. And you'll go to heaven. And he'll never leave you nor forsake you. I don't see how people make it in the world without the Lord. Amen. We need him. If you've never been saved, come to him today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads about eyes are closed. We talked a little bit about problems, burdens, situations that we don't like. And they happen to all of us. And it's not a matter of whether they're going to happen. It's just when are they going to but maybe you're here today and you'd say, I'm not a Christian. I've never been saved. Well, that's, this is your day. This is your day of all days. If you want to come to the Lord, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'd like to ask him into your heart, would you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sin. Save my soul. Make me a home in heaven. Thank you for dying in my place on that cross. In Jesus' name. Now heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you prayed that simple prayer of faith and you really meant it today, I'm not going to embarrass you or come to you. I just want to lift you up in prayer and pray that God's going to bless you as a Christian. If you ask the Lord into your heart today, would you just look up and I'll pray for you. Anyone, anywhere, preacher, pray for me. I ask Christ to be my Savior. Maybe today you'd say, I know the Lord and I'm so glad I'm saved. And I need his strength, and I need his help, and I've got some burdens, and I know God is going to use them to make me a stronger Christian. Pray for me that God will touch me and help me and strengthen me in this process and help me to keep my focus on him. I'll be glad to pray. If you don't like that, you'd slip a hand up all around the building. Hands are lifted everywhere. Father, you've seen our hands. You know our hearts. We're weak without you. But we know that you're using all these problems, even this old virus. Lord, just to build our faith in God, and we know that you're stronger than any virus. You're stronger than anything that we're ever going to face. And so we give you the praise for it. Bless each one that raised a hand, whatever the need or the burden is. Encourage us, lift us up. Let us leave here rejoicing, knowing that our God doeth all things well. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand our feet while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Charles, play softly. Maybe you just want to come around the altar and just pour that burden out to the Lord today. He'll help you. He'll give you strength. Don't ever be ashamed to come to the altar. It's always open for whosoever. Maybe you just want to come down and thank God for what he's done in your life. Maybe you just want to come down and pray for a loved one. Maybe you just want to come down and say, Lord, it seems like I just need to be more thankful because you have used a lot of things to make me stronger in my life. Or if you've been saved or you want to be saved, you come. We'll be glad to pray with you. How do the Lord lead you? People are coming around the altar. God will help you. He will give you strength. He will touch you. Oh, He will answer your prayer. If you lack wisdom, you got to make a big decision. Ask God. He'll show you. He'll give you a peace about it. If you don't have peace, don't do it. But 
If he gives you that peace, you know you can walk through that door. He will help you. Amen. Anybody else? Oh, I'm glad he's looking after us. I'm so glad that he's taking care of us. And I'm so glad that even though we have problems, that he is the great problem solver. He knows how to take care of you. Amen. Anybody else? You can. Is everyone still praying? You're glad you know that great position today. Let's give them a big amen together. Ready? Amen. Thank God for that. Hope you have a great day today. Charles, would you dismiss us in prayer? And don't forget, 6 o'clock tonight, we'll have the good singing and pizza follow. Oh, Charles. Father, again, it's been a privilege to be in the house of God. Lord, we just thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the good word that we heard, the singing, and the praise, and the worship, and the prayer. But Lord, we ask now that you go with us as we dismiss. Allow us to travel in grace and mercy this afternoon. Be with us in the remainder of this day. Bring us back to the next appointed hour. For it is in Christ's name. Amen.
You got that?